This is the story of Krista Pike, the youngest female to ever be sentenced to death in the U.S. when she was just 18 years old. The things that this young lady did are absolutely shocking and particularly heinous, which is why this was a death penalty case. Krista, who is now 46 years old, still sits on death row awaiting her execution date. However, along with her lawyer, she has continued to fight to have her death sentence commuted to life in prison. So far, she has been unsuccessful, however, that could change. The difference between receiving a death sentence or not comes down to just one year in age. If Krista were 17 years old when she committed murder, the death penalty would have been off the table completely. So does Krista deserve a second chance at life? Or was the crime she committed so heinous that she cannot be helped? Krista Gale Pike was born on March 10, 1976, in West Virginia. Things were done to her by those who were supposed to love and care for her even before she ever left the womb. Her mother would drink while she was pregnant with Krista, and doctors would later say this likely contributed to an underdeveloped brain. She was also born prematurely and given to her grandmother to be raised almost immediately after birth. Her mother chose partying, drinking and drugs over her and her father didn't want to be involved in her life in any way. So, you would think that it's probably a good thing that Krista's grandmother raised her. Unfortunately, her grandmother was just as terrible. She was also an alcoholic and lived with a man she was dating, who was alleged to have molested Krista from a very early age. When her grandmother died in 1988, 12-year-old Krista was sent to live with her mother, who was now working as a nurse and yet still did not have a single motherly bone in her body. Her mother also had a physically violent and abusive boyfriend living with her who would take his anger out on Krista. She would be beaten by him using a belt and again no one stepped in to help her. When she was still a child, Krista's mother decided that she would bond with her the only way she knew how. By smoking marijuana together. As you can imagine, this was not your typical mother-daughter relationship. Krista's mother treated her more as a friend. There were no rules in the home. No routines. Krista was basically allowed to do whatever she wanted, whenever she wanted as long as it didn't bother the live-in boyfriend. When the boyfriend became too much, sometimes Krista would stay with her birth father, but that relationship was also very strained. He hadn't really been involved in her upbringing and now she was an out-of-control teenager who didn't want to listen to any sort of parenting. As a result, she was kicked out of his home at least twice before she would turn 18. She definitely struggled in school and it's easy to see with such a tumultuous situation in her home life. She dropped out of high school, which gave her even more time to find trouble. Soon she started shoplifting and was arrested even spending time at a detention center for her crime. What will become apparent as we go further into this story is that Krista Pike is not a sneaky criminal. She's not careful, she's not elusive, everything she does makes it seem as if she wants to be caught. But after her time in the detention center was up, it almost seemed as if she was finally going to turn her life around. She enrolled in a career training program called Job Corps. According to their website, Job Corps helps eligible young people ages 16 through 24 complete their high school education, trains them for meaningful careers, and assists them with obtaining employment. At 18 years old, Krista wanted to follow in her mother's footsteps and become a nurse and this program would meet her where she was in life and allow her to do that. It was at Job Corps that Krista would meet her boyfriend, 17-year-old Tatterall Ship, who was studying culinary arts. Together, they were a perfect storm. Much like Krista, Tatterell had a difficult upbringing. His mother raised him by herself but she struggled to make ends meet so they were very poor and lived in a bad neighborhood. Tatterell would run with street gangs, get into criminal activity and drop out of school in grade 9. He was trying to do the same thing as Krista, make one last ditch effort to try and get his life together. Unfortunately, the pair spent most of their time getting into trouble together instead of studying. Krista's best friend was another young woman at Job Corp, named Shadala Peterson. The pair quickly hit it off and apparently had a lot in common with each other, including an interest in Satanism, which they are both rumored to have practiced. Tatterall was also interested in the occult and the three of them, Krista, 
Shadala and Tataril were even overheard frequently talking about participating in a human sacrifice. Unfortunately, no one took them seriously. Until along came 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer, another young lady from Jacksonville, Florida who was also taking classes at Job Corporation. Colleen was studying computer technology and ran in a completely different circle than Krista. The two probably would have never crossed paths, however, a rumor began to circulate that involved Colleen and Tatterell. There was chatter about Colleen pursuing Tatterell and the two of them even hooking up at one point. It's unclear whether there was ever any validity to the rumor, Colleen's friends would say no way, while Tatterell would eventually confess to the pair hooking up behind Krista's back. Either way, Krista was incredibly jealous and possessive of her boyfriend. She wasn't going to let another curl at him, whether the relationship was real or imagined. One day in January of 1995, Krista was at Job Corp and she casually mentioned to one of her classmates that she had decided to kill Colleen because she just felt mean that day. Again, the classmate didn't really take her seriously and thought she was just angry about the rumors involving her boyfriend. But the following day, Krista asked Colleen to hang out with her, Tatterell and her friend Shadala. They planned to head out to the park that evening in smoke pot and Krista had offered to share with her as part of some sort of peace offering. Around 8 p.m. that evening, the four were spotted walking away together from the job court dormitory, however, only three would return a few hours later. Once they were away from prying eyes, the real plan became clear. Krista was going to kill Colleen, as a human sacrifice and out of pure rage and jealousy. Her friend Shadala acted as a lookout to make sure that no one was walking their way or could see what was happening. For the next 30 minutes, Krista viciously tortured Colleen. First, she made her undress, removing both her shirt and her bra to humiliate her. Krista and Tatterell began to kick Colleen as she lay on the ground. Then Krista took out two weapons which she had brought with her, a meat cleaver and a box cutter. She began cutting Colleen with the box cutter, carving a pentagram on her stomach. Then she began stabbing Colleen and slicing at her skin, cutting her more than 300 times while she was still very much alive. Colleen tried to talk to Krista while she was lying on the ground bleeding. She tried to convince her to stop, saying that if they let her go she would go back to Florida immediately and never come back. This didn't stop Krista. Instead, she took a large piece of asphalt that was lying on the ground and began hitting Colleen on the head with it until she died a very agonizing death. Krista would later describe the gargling sounds that Colleen was making as she choked and suffocated on her own blood. When Colleen finally stopped making noises and it was clear she had died, Krista bent down and picked up a piece of Colleen's skull, putting it in her jacket pocket to save it as some sort of trophy. Then, the three of them covered her body up with leaves and walked back to the dormitory as if nothing had happened. They left Colleen's body behind in the park in a very shallow grave not even making any attempt to hide it. Krista returned back to her dorm room around 11 p.m. and again, she didn't try to hide anything. Her roommate was there, and she was ready to brag about what she had just done. She told her roommate straight up that she had killed Colleen, and when the roommate didn't believe her, she pulled a piece of skull out of her pocket to prove it. Later on, this roommate would testify in court that Krista appeared to be very proud of what she had done. She was smiling and dancing around as she retold the story. And yet, no one went to the police and I'll never be able to understand why. It wasn't until two days later when an employee of Job Corp stumbled across the body, at first believing it to be the remains of an animal, but discovering it was a mangled human body upon closer inspection. It was Colleen Slemmer, just left there in plain sight for anyone to find. The cause of death was blunt force trauma, but she had been brutally tortured before she finally succumbed to being hit in the head with the asphalt. Her body was so badly brutalized that the first responding officer couldn't tell if he was looking at her face or not. Her body had too many wounds to count and the medical examiner noted that around each of the wounds was red, which meant that Colleen's heart was still bleeding when they were inflicted. She was alive when she received all of those stab wounds when her throat was cut and the pentagram was sliced into her skin. Krista bragged about the killing to just about anyone who would listen to her, so once Colleen's body was recovered, it didn't take the police long to determine who their main suspect was. 
When they brought her into the station for questioning, she confessed to the entire thing and gave police permission to search her dorm room, where they would find her jeans soaked with Colleen's blood. She showed investigators where she had dumped evidence, including Colleen's ID, and then she retraced her steps back to the scene of the crime, giving them all the details they would need to build a solid case against her. If there was ever any doubt whether Krista had killed Colleen, it would be squashed when a school counselor discovered a jacket that Krista had left behind in his office. In the pocket of the jacket was that piece of Colleen's skull. Krista would give a lengthy confession about the horror she unleashed on Colleen. She wrote that the two young women had been having issues for some time, mainly over Krista's boyfriend and rumors that Colleen was pursuing him. Initially, Krista said she just wanted to scare her to get her to stop running her mouth and to leave her alone. According to Krista, Colleen pleaded for her life, but this only made her angrier because the more she talked, the more difficult she found it to go through with the killing. She described how at one point she thought she heard someone walking toward them so she stopped the attack to look around. Colleen took this opportunity to try to get up and run away, but Krista pushed her back to the ground and began kicking her in the face. Krista claimed she wanted to put Colleen out of her pain and misery, so she did her a favor by hitting her in the head with a large piece of asphalt. She also sold out her boyfriend and her friend naming Tatterall Ship and Shadala Peterson as her co-conspirators. Krista was charged with murder. While it was absolutely crystal clear that she had tortured and murdered Colleen, her attorneys tried to argue that she had a diminished mental capacity and very severe borderline personality disorder. They pointed toward her difficult upbringing and the abuse she suffered as a child, as well as her dependency on marijuana. What's really interesting is the findings that one expert discovered a doctor named Jonathan Henry Pincus studied Krista Pike's brain and found that her frontal lobes were not put together properly. It is the frontal lobe where a sense of right and wrong is developed and recorded. He testified that he believes Krista was doomed from the beginning when her mother was pregnant with her. She continued to drink heavily which resulted in Krista's brain not forming properly. He continued to say that every killer he has ever examined shares three features, brain damage, a history of abuse and mental illness and Krista had all three of these features. These factors are likely a reason for her committing murder, but they are absolutely not an excuse, and the courts agreed because she was found guilty of capital murder and conspiracy to commit murder. It only took the jury two hours to reach their decision. But if there was ever any doubt as to whether or not Krista was remorseful over her actions, well let me just clear that up. After trial, she wrote her boyfriend a letter in prison, which said, Please write me. I miss you so much. You see what I get for trying to be nice to the O? I went ahead and bashed her brains out so she died quickly instead of letting her bleed to death and suffer more, and they F fry me. Ain't that some ass? Please write me and tell me what you're feeling, also, tell your lawyer if he wants me to testify for you. I will. Love you for the rest of my life. Lil Devil. As for her boyfriend Tatterall Ship, he would also be convicted of murder for the role that he played and he was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Krista's best friend Shadala Peterson, who acted as the lookout, testified against both Krista and Tatterall and received probation in exchange for her testimony. As for Krista, she would never be leaving prison. She was sentenced to death by electrocution, which is practically unheard of for a young woman to receive such severe sentencing. But we all know how long these things take, so all she was sentenced back in 1996, she still sits on death row today. And she has been keeping very busy in prison. In 2004, she got into a tiff with another inmate named Patricia Jones and she tried to strangle her to death with a shoestring. Again, Krista has absolutely no capacity to try and hide her crimes and she confessed to the entire thing on a recorded phone call with her mother. Allegedly, she was recorded saying, I wrapped that shoestring around her and tried to choke the life out of her. She was passed out on the ground, mama, twitching, foaming at the mouth, her eyeballs was bugged out so far, her eyelids were flipped up. She was charged with first-degree attempted murder, not that it really matters, because she's already supposed to be executed. In 2012, I guess she became bored with her life behind bars and she attempted to escape. 
She made a plan with another inmate and a corrections officer, however, the plan ultimately failed. She was never charged for this attempt. Last year, Colleen's mother, May Martinez, petitioned the court to finally set a date for Krista Pike's execution. She said, I want this to happen before I die. Otherwise, nobody will see justice. It's been a long time coming, with Krista now being 46 years old. Her attorneys want her death sentence to be commuted to life behind bars due to her deteriorating mental health and the brain damage inflicted upon her because of her abusive childhood. As of now, there has been no date set. If she is put to death, she would be the first woman to be executed in Tennessee in roughly 200 years. Here we have come to the end of our story. Leave us your opinion in the comments. Subscribe to the channel if you like the content. Thank you all.